Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good all the time and all the time God is good. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore, Will I hope in him? Thank you, Lord, for being my portion. And I thank you, Lord, for your mercies that never fail. Your mercies that continue to strengthen us each and every new morning that you wake us up to walk under your son once again. Lord, whatever we've done that was not pleasing in your sight, whatever we said, whatever we thought, we thank you for the blood of Jesus that has cleansed us from all sin, past, present, and future. And so we forsake everything that is not in accordance with who you are, your will, and we pray that we will be clothed with the whole armor of God today to walk in victory, to walk in power, to walk by the Spirit and not in the flesh. For there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. So Lord, help us right now as we study your word. Give us fresh and a new anointing. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we can behold wondrous things out of your Torah. Thine is the power and the glory and the kingdom forever and ever. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And we pray for the peace of Jerusalem in the name above all names, Jesus the Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Well, thank you for coming back to another teaching installment of When the Temple in Heaven is Open, Everything Will Change. And today I want to go over some things because the Lord put it on my heart to go over these things. And I want to take a look at pinpointing the great earthquake. And in the midst of my studying for this topic, pinpointing the great earthquake, I saw some wonderful things when looking at the prophet Elijah. And we know that Elijah is a type of the rapture because both him and Enoch are the only two examples in the word of God of people going to heaven without ever dying. And God has laid out a pattern that every 2,000 years within that 2,000 year time frame based on a 6,000 year model of man's work on the earth with the seventh day God uh, resting, which is the thousand year millennial reign. So every 2,000 years, within every 2,000 years broken up into three different 2,000 year periods, God has a rapture event. So within the first 2,000 years of human history, the rapture event that God did was with Enoch, who walked with God and then God took him. And then the next 2,000 year history, from 2,000 to the year 4,000, there was a rapture event. And that rapture event was the prophet Elijah, who was taken up into heaven in a whirlwind and chariots of fire. And so, because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, there has to be another rapture event with these next 2,000 years, which we are currently in under, from the year 4,000 to the year 6,000. There has to be a rapture event based upon the pattern with Enoch and Elijah. And so within this 2,000-year period, the Bible tells us that there is going to come a rapture event when the man-child is caught up unto heaven and to the throne of God, which is the body of Christ. And so 
when we take a look at what God did in the past, we can see how he operates. And I want to take a closer look at the prophet Elijah in order to give some background information about what God is going to do in order to establish his kingdom on the earth. Hallelujah. And the first order of events that God is going to do when he establishes his kingdom on the earth is to rapture the body of Christ, which in turn will send the greatest earthquake in human history on the planet, which will totally change the topography of the planet in which the fourth beast kingdom will take over for the last seven years of this age. So let's go to uh, the Old Testament and help us, Holy Spirit, to see what you have to say and teach us great and mighty things that we do not know. And let's go to the uh, book of 1 Kings chapter 19. And so the background to 1 Kings chapter 19 is that Elijah has defeated the prophets of Baal. He challenged the prophets of Baal, 450, and uh, the 400 who ate at Jezebel's table. So 850 altogether. And he told them to come up to Mount Carmel. And he challenged them to see who was the true and living God by performing a sacrifice. And whoever was the true God would send fire upon the sacrifice and consume the sacrifice. And so the story tells us that the prophets of Baal, uh, they set up their sacrifice and they wailed all day and all afternoon into the night and they were cutting themselves and uh, no one would hear them when they were calling upon Baal, which is, of course, the devil. And that just to tells us how impotent the devil is uh, compared to God, because God only allows the devil what the sovereign plan and will of God wants him to do. Okay. The, the, yeah, the devil, he, 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 he runs roughshod a little bit because he's the God of this world, but never forget he's on a leash. Hallelujah. He's on a leash. He's on a very short leash. Hallelujah. Because the Holy spirit restrains his evil work. And if, uh, God says, no, he can't do something. Well, he can't do it. The devil can't do it. Okay, the devil can't do it unless God gives him permission. We know that from the book of Job, where uh, all the sons of God have to come before God and present themselves before him every so often. I don't know the schedule, but we know that it happens. And uh, God already pulled his card and he said to the enemy, the devil, have you considered my servant Job? And, you know, then they had uh, that that back and forth and God told him exactly what he was allowed to do. OK, and so the devil is on a very short leash. That is why in this story, um, the prophets of Baal, they could not call down fire because God did not allow the devil to do it. OK, now, if the devil was in control, if he was the sovereign, of course, he would have call down fire on the sacrifice but that shows us who's in charge god is in charge because when um when elijah set up his sacrifice he he even went above and beyond and he started to pour water on the sacrifice and when it was time to call down fire god not only burnt up uh, the sacrifice he also burnt up the stones and he burnt up all the water <laughs> you know uh, that's the that's the god we serve water is supposed to put out fire fire is not supposed to put out water but god is the almighty and he can do anything for is there anything that's too hard for god of course not and so here we go with the next chapter and this is a teaching in itself, and I just want to go over it real quick. And so after that contest on uh, Mount Carmel, Elijah flees Jezebel. And so a lot has been said about this in sermons, but I just want to uh, relate it to the end times and to the church age that we're living in right now. You see, this speaks of 
us, members of the body of Christ, we also have to flee Jezebel, okay? We have to run from Jezebel, okay? Because Jezebel is on the prowl, especially uh, in regards to the church in Thyatira. The church in Thyatira in Revelation chapter 2, that church God rebukes because it allows that prophetess, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, uh, to teach and to seduce her uh, God's servants to commit idolatry and, and enter into fornication. And so we see this in uh, uh, Revelation chapter 2 with the message to the church of Thyatira, uh, verse 20, Revelation chapter 2, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against you because you sufferest that woman Jezebel which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not. Verse 22, here's the key. Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Okay, so the first mention of great tribulation in the book of Revelation is in regards to God warning the church of Thyatira not to commit adultery with Jezebel. Because if the church of Thyatira commits adultery with Jezebel, God says that he's going to throw those people who do not repent into great tribulation. Okay, so the first mention of great tribulation in all the book of Revelation is a warning to a church. The church in Thyatira. Okay. And so we see that we need to do the same thing that Elijah did. We have to flee from Jezebel, okay? Because Jezebel wanted to kill Elijah, just like the uh, spirit of Jezebel, which is alive and well today, who's lurking in every corner, in every pulpit, in every, uh, uh, every street corner, trying to seduce the servants of God into fornication and into... Uh, sacrificing unto idols, okay? Jezebel, the spirit of Jezebel is everywhere, but we have to run from Jezebel. We have to flee from Jezebel, just like Elijah and just like the other Old Testament example with uh, Joseph when Potiphar's wife came after him day after day. She had the spirit of Jezebel before Jezebel was even on, uh, even conceived, Potiphar's wife. And Potiphar's wife went after Joseph day by day and said, lie with me, lie with me, lie with me. And because Joseph was a man of integrity, which we all have to be, hallelujah, either man or woman, we have to be people of integrity. He said he couldn't do it. He couldn't sin against God and commit such a great wickedness. And so he had to flee. And we already know what happened with that story. And he he kept his in integrity. OK, that's the whole point. He kept his integrity and he didn't fall for the advances of Potiphar's wife, which was a foreshadow of Jezebel. And so just like Joseph fled, just like Elijah fled, we also have to flee. OK, we have to flee from this prophetess who who thinks she's a prophetess, this, this woman Jezebel. We have to flee from her because she's, she, uh, uh, she takes no prisoners, okay? She takes no prisoners if we fall for her trap. And so, uh, furthermore, this is hammered home because once Elijah fled, um, he went 40 days and 40 nights in order to um, go to the mount that God had told him to go to, which was Mount Horeb. And so we know that the number 40 is always symbolic of a period of testing, of trial, or of probation. And so 
again in the types and shadows this speaks of uh, that 2000 year period because if you take 40 and you times it by uh, uh jubilees okay every every 50 years there's a jubilee 40 times 50 is 2000 okay so if you put your mind on the different levels that god is speaking to us about we we're in this last 2000 year period where the church age is reigning and for those of us who are being chased after Jezebel we have to be just like Elijah during this 2000 year period okay because if we're not like Elijah if we don't do what God says in regards to the church in Thyatira by repenting we have to repent we can't uh, be seduced and fall into that temptation to uh, lie with Jezebel and uh, listen to her soothing words that are uh, sweet as as honey, but in her in in her in her belly is nothing but the pits of hell. Okay, her her words are smoother than butter. Okay, but in her heart is filled with nothing but the worst kinds of wickedness and idolatry and fornication that leads to nothing but utter destruction, okay? And so God has given us this test for 2,000 years, our probation period, 40 times uh, 50, hallelujah, 40 times 50, uh, our probation period during the church age where we are fleeing from all forms of idolatry, from all forms of wickedness, from all forms of things that try to come against God. We're just like Elijah. We're fleeing to the mountain of God. We're on our way to Mount Horeb, but that Mount Horeb is really Mount Zion, the heavenly city, uh, the new Jerusalem. And look at the wonderful shadow that continues, because remember, God is speaking to us on multiple levels at the same time. Okay, he's speaking in just so many different ways, and with the Holy Spirit, he always instructs us in the way that he wants to communicate his word to us on all these different levels. But remember, the whatever level the Holy Spirit is speaking to us on is always going to match with orthodox teaching, which confirms the throughout any Bible story, the whole the whole picture will always be the same. Okay, so everything that I'm saying through the power of the Holy Spirit is nothing different than what we already know. Okay, but this, God is just bringing out uh, his word from another angle. Hallelujah. And so here we get, see when Elijah finally gets to Mount Horeb, uh, this is a picture of the rapture. Okay, because uh, the Lord brings him to a cave and Elijah goes into the cave and he stands upon a rock. Hallelujah. And so that enter, that that speaks of for all of us who have passed that 40 night and 40 day test that that 2000 year period, we're going to be taken into the heavenly Zion and we're going to be hidden. OK, we're going to be hidden because we're going to be standing upon the rock and that rock is Jesus. He's the rock. And the father's house is our shelter and we're going to be protected because Look what happens when Elijah goes into the cave. This is a picture of the, the, the great and terrible day of the Lord beginning. Okay, and so verse 11, 1 Kings chapter 19 tells us this. This is God speaking to Elijah. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. So that's, that represents the rapture. Okay, he's inside the cave. And the Lord is protecting him from what's coming. And so this is what this is what comes after those who are taken in the rapture. This is what comes. Uh, and behold, the Lord passed by. OK, so the Lord is going to pass by. OK, he's coming. He's coming down off his throne. He's going to pass by. My goodness. Look what happens when he passes by. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. Okay. So when the, 
Lord passes by, hallelujah. When he passes by, the first thing that happens when he passes by is that there's going to be a strong wind that's going to break in pieces the rocks, okay? The mountains are going to fall, okay? Because God is passing through. So the first thing that passes through is a strong wind. But the Lord was not in the wind, okay? It's, it's the judgment of God, okay? <laughs> it's the judgment of God. He has total control over everything. He's the sovereign. He's the one who made everything, okay? He's not in the wind, okay? He uses the wind. And I'm going to show you how this is seen in the book of Revelation. So the first thing that happens is that the wind is sent, Okay, but God isn't in the wind. He's sending his judgment upon the planet. This is a picture of the day of the Lord when it begins. And then what happens after the wind? And after the wind, an earthquake. Okay, <laughs> there goes that earthquake. We're going to get into it. But after the wind, there comes an earthquake. Okay, this is God passing through. Remember, the text is... The whole premise is that the Lord is passing by, okay? We have to understand who who the Lord is. This is yod Hey vav Hey. This is the one who in the beginning said, let there be light, and there was light. Okay, we're talking about God, my friends. Now, how, how do you imagine God? I mean, of course, we haven't seen him, but how do you imagine him? Okay, if you imagine uh, the God that we know, the God that we love, who his love is just so perfect, so wonderful. But on the other hand, his wrath is just as perfect as his love, okay? And his wrath is terrible. It's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God, okay? Now, just imagine the God that we love filled with wrath. I don't even really want to imagine it because I don't want to feel it. And, I, and we're not going to feel it because we're not appointed under wrath, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And just like Elijah was hidden in the cave, we're going to be hidden. But the point is that we have to get our minds wrapped around the devastation Station that is going to come upon the planet when the Lord passes by. Okay, this is just at the beginning when the great tribulation begins. Okay, when the day of the Lord begins, God is going to visit this planet. Okay, he's going to visit this planet and understand that when God visits this planet and you're left behind, you're going to be in a world of trouble right when it begins. There's not even a guarantee if you're left behind that you will even survive when the Lord passes by. You, 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 there's no guarantee. Okay, all bets are off if you're left behind. Okay, if you're left behind on the cloudy and dark day, you might just die right when it begins, because uh, when the Lord passes by, there's going to be dead bodies in every place, says the prophets. From one end of the earth to the other end of the earth, the dead will lay. This is God coming. He's coming to pass through and bring judgment because he's filled with wrath against sin. And he's going to lay the whole land desolate. My goodness, the, the earth is going to be a wasteland once the Lord passes by. Okay, the earth is going to be completely different. It's not the earth that you see today. As the prophet Daniel always tells us with that fourth beast kingdom, he says it's different. Okay, it's different. It's different. It's different. The fourth beast kingdom is not like anything that we see today. Everything that you see in this world today is not going to be in that fourth beast kingdom as far as how life is operating, okay? There's no more going to the movies. There's no more going to the mall. There's no more going to Ralph's. There's no more going to Walmart. There's no more going to Target. There's no more going to McDonald's. There's no more going to an NBA game. There's no more going to a soccer game. There's no more going to a rugby game. There's no more going to a concert. Okay, there's no more of any of the joy that people have in this world today. Okay? God says that even strong drink will be bitter unto those who drink it. 
People won't even find satisfaction in alcohol anymore. And you see how crazy people go over alcohol today. Okay? But even in uh, the end of the age, God says that strong drink will be bitter unto those who drink it. Okay? That fourth beast kingdom is dreadful and terrible. Okay? It's totally different than the world we see today. And all those programming movies that we've seen and heard about, Mad Max, Book of Eli, all of those apocalyptic movies, The Terminator, all of those movies are programming people for what's coming during the seven-year tribulation. The earth will be a wasteland. Okay, the earth will be utterly wasted because God is passing through. He's the one who lays it waste. And then... Uh, all of the wars that are taking place as well uh, also contribute to it because the great war that's going to come is the nuclear war. So it's a double whammy. It's a double whammy of destruction, but the biggest whammy is the Lord himself because he's coming. Okay, I'm sorry I got hung up right there, but God is good. So when the Lord passes by, the first thing that happens is that a wind comes, but he's not in the wind. And then the next thing that happens after the wind is an earthquake, but the Lord is not in the earthquake. And then verse 12, and after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. Okay. And so we see that these three elements, the strong wind, the earthquake and the fire is the same sequence of events that happens in the book of Revelation chapter 6. Uh, Revelation chapter 6, when the seven seal scroll is open. So remember, the first thing that happens is the rapture, okay? Because Elijah is told to go into the cave. And uh, when Elijah is in the cave, he stands upon the rock. He stands upon the rock and he's hidden inside the mouth of the cave. Okay. So when all of this happens, the first thing that occurs is the rapture of the church. Okay. The rapture of the church, the body of Christ, we go into the father's house and the door is shut. We're protected from the Lord passing by in judgment. The Lord is coming to get us and bring us up to be where he at, uh, to, to be where he is at. Okay. And so we're protected just like Elijah was protected. But if you're left behind, God shows us the same order of events that are going to happen. The wind is going to come, the earthquake is going to come, and the fire is going to come. Revelation chapter 6. The first four seals are the wind, okay? The white horse, uh, the war, uh, the red horse, the... Uh, Black horse, which is famine, and the pale horse, this green horse, which is death. These are the four winds. This is the wind that comes first. We know that these first four seals are the wind because Zechariah chapter 6 tells us. Zechariah chapter 6 is the Old Testament shadow of the New Testament revelation. The vision of the four chariots. Again, I lifted up my eyes and saw, and behold... Four chariots came out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of bronze. The first chariot had red horses, the second black horses, the third white horses, and the fourth chariot dappled horses, all of them strong. Then I answered and said to the angel who talked with me, What are these, my lord? And the angel answered and said to me, These are going out to the four winds of heaven. After presenting themselves before the Lord of all the earth. Okay, so these four chariots are the four winds that are going to come. Remember in the book of Revelation, um, no judgment could come on the planet until the 144,000 are sealed. Okay, because uh, before the 144,000 are sealed, the four winds are being restrained. Okay, Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, 
holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. So right now the four winds are being restrained. Okay, the four winds are these first four seals. Okay, the four chariots that come out from between the two bronze pillars, the bronze mountains in in heaven. Those two bronze mountains are were symbolized in the Temple of Solomon with the two pillars of Jacan and Boaz. Okay, that stood before the door to the temple. Okay, so once the temple doors are opened in heaven, these four um, horses are going to be sent out. Okay. And that's the wind. Okay. Remember God tells us the end from the beginning. And so the rapture happens first. Elijah is put into the cave. He stands upon the rock, the church. We're going to go into the father's house. We're standing upon the rock, Jesus Christ. He's our protection. And then the Lord is going to pass by. Okay. We can't, <laughs> we can't forget that because this is the Lord who's coming. And so the first thing that comes when he comes is a great wind, okay? The Ruach, okay? Ruach is wind, okay? And so that wind is these four judgments of the first four seals, okay? I pray that that's clear. So what's next, God says? God says after the wind, there's an earthquake, okay? So where do we see the earthquake in Revelation chapter 6? Well, Revelation chapter 6, the earthquake is here in the sixth seal, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. Okay, so here we go with this great earthquake. This was going to be the teaching today. Um, and so the point of this great earthquake is that it happens at the time when Jesus Christ begins the great and dreadful day of the Lord. This great earthquake happens when... Um, the rapture happens first, and then when God comes to lay judgment upon the planet, he sends the four winds, which are the first four seals, because remember, the, the seven-sealed scroll that the Lamb has in his hand is open just like you open a letter. It's all open at that same moment. It's not like he's peeling off one seal here, two seal there, three seal there. No, he's not doing it like that. He's opening it up. He's opening up the scroll, okay? The scroll is sealed with these seven seals, so he's going to open the scroll. And once he opens the scroll, all of these seven seals are manifested, okay? And it's manifested over time, but it all begins uh, when the day of the Lord happens. Because when the day of the Lord happens, the first thing that has to happen is the rapture, okay? The rapture has to occur first. And once the rapture happens and then the Lord is going to pass by the earth and the wind, come, the wind comes first, the first four seals. And then the great earthquake comes. OK, the great earthquake comes and before and I'm going to get back to this great earthquake, but I want to finish the teaching. So after the earthquake, what happens after the earthquake, a fire. OK, so after the earthquake, there comes a fire. So what's the next thing that happens after the great earthquake? The sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Verse 13, here comes the fire. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Okay, so... Now the stars falling from, from heaven unto the earth is multifaceted. It's the fallen angels being kicked out of heaven, yes. And it's also the hailstorm that is coming uh, on the planet, okay? It's both. It's the, it's, the, it's the fallen angels coming down. They're getting kicked out of heaven. And it's also um, the hailstorm, uh, the hailstones and coals of fire that are being cast to the earth, so we see a perfect picture because God will never lie to us and he always confirms his word by telling us what will happen from the beginning. God cannot go against his word. He can't go off script. If he tells us the end from the beginning, the beginning always has to tell us the end. And so as we just saw, this perfect picture of Elijah, which is a type of the rapture, has the clues to help us understand 
how God has already declared to us the end from the beginning. So when we go to the end, the book of Revelation, we could go back to the beginning, 1 Kings 19, to see how the word is confirmed. Okay? So, back to the great earthquake, okay? Because this great earthquake is key to understanding when uh, and where it happens. So we already know when it happens, which is at the beginning of uh, the day of the Lord. And so the question is, where does this great earthquake happen? Where does it take place? Well, the answer is that the great earthquake takes place centered in Israel, but it affects the whole world. Okay, the greatest earthquake in human history, because this great earthquake happens um, in the book of Ezekiel with the battle of Gog and Magog. Okay, with the battle of Gog and Magog, this is um, when uh, this coming tribulation begins. It happens when God stands up and he protects Israel from the invading forces of Gog and Magog. And we see that in the destruction of Gog and Magog, the wind, the earthquake, and the fire are all mentioned. Okay, so in Ezekiel chapter 38, let me just read at verse 18. And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beast of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. Okay, so... Do you see what God is saying? God is saying everything that's on the planet is going to shake. Everything. If you're left behind, you're going to shake because God is coming. He's passing through. He's not in the earthquake, though. He's not in the wind. And he's not in the fire. This is his judgment. He's passing through. Hallelujah. And everyone is going to shake at his presence. And what else happens? And the mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. Now, the question is, do you believe the word of God? Do you believe that every wall is going to fall to the ground, or do we just take this as hyperbole? Well, <laughs> I believe God is accurate 100%, and every wall is, yes, every defense you know, that man trusts in is going to be broken and shattered because the only wall that's going to stand is Jesus Christ. And we have to be in the Father's house in order to have the wall that he has built stand because he is our strong tower. Hallelujah. But if you're trusting in anything else, it's going to be broken to the ground on the cloudy day. But this also is telling us that Every wall, because every city on the planet is going to be devastated by this earthquake. Every city on the planet is going to fall, okay, because God is going to shake everything in the world. Verse 21, and I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. And I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him and overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself. And I will be known in the eyes of many nations and they shall know that I am the Lord. Okay, so this great earthquake that the book of Revelation tells us is going to happen, okay, when Jesus Christ comes on the clouds, this great earthquake that the shadow in 1 Kings tells us is going to happen is identified for us happening in the book of Ezekiel chapter 38 when everything falls to the ground. Every creeping thing, every fowl of the heaven, every beast of the field, and every man on the planet who's left behind is going to fall to the ground. This great earthquake happens at the time when Gog and Magog try to attack Israel. Therefore, knowing what we know, if you've been reading your Bible and studying to show yourself approved, you know that 
At the same time that Gog and Magog happens, the fall of Babylon the Great also happens. So if we go to the Old Testament telling of the fall of Babylon, we should also see the wind, the fire, and the earthquake in the fall of Babylon. Okay, so let's go to Jeremiah chapter 50. Jeremiah chapter 50, uh, verse, uh, verse 46, tells us that at the noise of the taking of Babylon, the earth is moved and the cry is heard among the nations. Okay, so God says that when Babylon falls, the whole earth is moved. What's the Hebrew word for uh, moved? What, what's the Hebrew word uh, for moved? Okay, that's uh, the Hebrew word, as you can see, ra'ash, to quake, to shake. So the whole earth is going to shake. You see how, you see what God says? He didn't just say Babylon is going to shake. He didn't just say Babylon is going to just shake. He said the whole earth, okay? The whole earth is going to shake, is going to quake when Babylon is destroyed. It's that great earthquake that shakes everything, okay? It's the greatest earthquake in human history. Okay, so what else do we need? We need uh, we need the fire. Okay, here we go with the fire. Go, is there fire that comes upon Babylon? Uh, Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 32. And the most proud shall stumble and fall, and none shall raise him up. And I will kindle a fire in his cities, and it shall devour all round about him. Okay, so here again, God tells us that the fire is also going to consume Babylon. And as you can see, Babylon has cities, okay? Babylon has cities, okay? Babylon has cities, okay? It's the whole nation, my friends. Okay, so what else do we need? Now we need the wind, okay? Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 1. Severe judgment against Babylon. Look what look at what God says. Thus saith the Lord. Okay, do you believe what thus saith the Lord? Do you believe what God says? Or are you going to go with your own opinion, your own ideas, your own intuition, your own thinking? Are, are you going to believe what thus saith the Lord? Well, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to trust what he says because he knows everything. His perfect will will come to pass. And look what God says about the wind. Thus saith the Lord, behold, I will raise up against Babylon and against them that dwell in the midst of them that rise up against me, a destroying wind. I mean, the proof is in the pudding. I don't, you know, I only go by what God says in his word. Now, if you want to argue with what the Bible says, hey, that's on you. But I'm going to stick with what the book says. And what the book tells me when we go line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, the word agrees with the word. Okay, so you really can't argue these things. Okay, because this Old Testament shadow of the pre-tribulation rapture and then the Lord passing through to send a wind, an earthquake, and a fire is all seen in the book of Revelation, okay? We went through that and then we saw when it happens and it happens when Gog and Magog is destroyed and when the fall of Babylon the Great happens, okay? All three of the elements occur. The destroying wind, the earthquake, which causes not just a local spot to shake, but the whole entire planet to shake. Now look at Isaiah chapter 24. Look at how devastating, look at how devastating this earthquake is. Look at how devastating God describes this earthquake because it's terrible, my friends. It's the end of the age. Look at what God says about um, this earthquake. Oh, but let me start in verse 16. Uh, <laughs> well, let, 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 let me, oh, this whole chapter, verse 20, the, Isaiah 24 is God's judgment on the earth. Uh, you know, your, your Bible might say the, the little apocalypse from Isaiah 24 to Isaiah 27 or 28 is titled the, the little uh, apocalypse because this is all like a mini 
abbreviated version of the book of Revelation. And so this all talks about why this judgment comes. And this judgment comes because of the treacherous dealer. <laughs> Look at verse 16. From the uttermost part of the earth have we heard songs, even glory to the righteous. But I said, my leanness, my leanness, woe unto me. The treacherous dealers have dealt treacherously. Yea, the treacherous dealers have dealt very treacherously. <laughs> I mean, hey, I don't know. I do know, but I, I don't know how people argue. But hey, <laughs> there's only one person who has the deal of the century on the table. And if you can't see between the lines about what this treacherous dealer that God is always talking about, which brings the day of sudden destruction upon the planet when people are saying peace and safety. I don't know what else. To, I, I, I don't know. I, I really don't know how you don't see it. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how you argue. I don't I don't know. I don't know. I do know. But I just, you know, hey, let me keep on. Let me keep on. Help me, Holy Spirit. Okay, so the treacherous dealer is again mentioned. And look at this earthquake. Look at look at the description. Fear and the pit and the snare are upon you, O inhabitant of the earth. Okay, this is for everyone who's left behind. Okay, and it shall come to pass that he who flees from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit. And he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare. For the windows from on high are open, and the foundation of the earth do shake. Okay, so the heavens are open because God is going to let us inside the Father's house, and God is going to shake out all those rebellious angels, and they're going to be falling down to the ground. The windows from on high are open, and at the same time that the heavens are shaking, what happens on the earth? The foundations of the earth do shake. Now look at the description of this great earthquake. Verse 19, the earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean, dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. Do you understand the language that God is using? We're talking about the end of the age, when the great tribulation begins, when God comes on the clouds. This is when the earth is going to be moved exceedingly. Babylon the Great is going to fall. Gog and Magog is going to be destroyed. And everyone on the planet is going to shake because the earth is moved exceedingly. Verse 20. Look at this. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall be removed like a cottage. And the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. Okay, this is the end of the age, okay? And God is going to make the earth reel to and fro like a drunken man, okay? The earth is going to be moved exceedingly, okay? This is that great earthquake that happens when Jesus Christ comes on the clouds, okay? And so... We see that this great earthquake is identified for us in the book of Revelation further when the temple in heaven is open. Revelation chapter 11, verse 19, and the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Okay, so we got the fire, we got the earthquake, and then uh, God is going to come and pass through with the wind, but he's not in the wind, he's not in the earthquake, and he's not in the hail. Furthermore, this great earthquake uh, is further uh, identified in the book of Revelation chapter 16, and he tells us how mighty and great this earthquake is. Uh, Revelation 16 verse 18, and there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. Okay, so it's the greatest earthquake in human history. If it's the, it, How could it be anything else, according to what Ezekiel 38 tells us, when every wall falls to the ground, when every person on the planet, both men, women, and, 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 
and kids if they're left behind without a covering and they're at the age of accountability, as well as all the beasts of the field and everything that creeps, even the fishes of the sea, as Ezekiel 38 verse 20 tells us. This, is a, this earthquake has never happened before. Okay, but when it happens, just look at the description. This is the, this is the same description that we're reading about here in Revelation. Okay, it's the greatest earthquake in human history. So mighty an earthquake and so great. It's the same event. Don't get confused because you see it here at the end of the book of Revelation in chapter 16. Remember, John is showing us the same event from different perspectives. There weren't chapter and verse divisions in the Bible. Okay, when it was first written, it was just written as John was getting the revelation. Okay, and when we have the Holy Spirit put the pieces together, we can understand that John is telling us the same event, but he's showing us the same event from different angles, and he's giving us more information every time he shows us the event. This is the event that happens when the temple in heaven is open. The voices, the thunders, and the lightnings clue us in that this is the same time when the temple in heaven is open, because when the temple in heaven is open, the, the same lightnings, voices, and thunderings are coming. Okay, uh, okay, so uh, understanding the patterns that God has in his word lets us understand the total plan and picture of God. And then when you put everything together by bringing in the Old Testament with the New Testament, we see the complete revelation. Okay, so verse 19, and the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. Okay, so every wall will fall to the ground as Ezekiel 38 tells us. And then uh, the the full complete revelation is that the cities of the nations fell. Okay, that goes if if the earth is going to be moved exceedingly according to the prophet Isaiah, and if it's going to reel to and fro like a drunkard. Okay, and if the earth is going to be utterly broken down, well then of course the cities of the nations are going to fall. Of course every wall is going to fall to the ground. This isn't a a far stretch. And when we understand that the fourth beast kingdom is different from every kingdom that came before it and that he breaks and that the earth is broken down into pieces. OK, we could understand the complete revelation. The whole world is different. The topography of the planet is different during the time of Jacob's trouble. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the fierceness of his wrath. So again, here goes Babylon the great mentioned in the destruction. And then verse 20, and every island fled away and the mountains were not found. Okay, so that clues us back to Revelation chapter 6 with the sixth seal. When uh, God comes down upon the clouds and uh, the Every mountain and island are going to be moved out of their places. Verse 14, Revelation chapter 6, And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Okay? So every island and mountain are moved out of their places. Revelation 16, 20, And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Okay? You, 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 I mean, just simple putting one and one together lets us understand that this is the same event. Just a different perspective that John is telling us of the event. And look, here goes the kicker, because not only is the earthquake coming, but also the great hail. Verse 21, And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Okay, so that's the great hailstorm. That's the fire. That's going to happen on the cloudy and dark day. The church is going to be raptured. And in regards to the rapture, we can see that when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, when he died and rose from the dead, there was also a great earthquake. And when the earth quaked, the graves were opened after his resurrection, and many went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Okay, so when Jesus Christ died, there was an earthquake in uh, when he, uh, let me read it, Matthew 27, verse 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in two from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, 
and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. So whenever there's a resurrection event, there's an earthquake. And so when the rapture happens, there's going to be an earthquake. Okay, uh, we're going to be raptured and the greatest earthquake in human history is going to occur. And so uh, the picture is being painted for us perfectly by God himself because only God can do it. And so finally, one final shadow, Ezekiel chapter 37. We know that this on one level, which is, of course, the most perfect level, this is about the restoration of the nation of Israel. But on another level, this is also telling us about the resurrection because this is the valley of dry bones. And in the valley of dry bones, there comes a great shaking and the wind comes and the wind gives life to these dead bones and these dead bones put on skin and sinew and then the breath of life comes into them and they stand up and so this is a picture of the resurrection okay and so understanding the types and shadows ezekiel 37 is the resurrection that happens first okay the resurrection is going to happen first and then the next chapter is ezekiel 38 and then here goes gog and magog where the wind and the fire and the earthquake come in judgment upon Gog and Magog. Okay, so we see a perfect picture. Ezekiel 37, the resurrection, okay, the resurrection of the dead. And for those of us who are alive, we're going to be caught up. Okay, and we're all going to be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Hallelujah. And so after the resurrection, which comes first, Ezekiel chapter 37, that's the resurrection. The next chapter is Gog and Magog, Ezekiel chapter 38, which is going to be the judgment upon everyone who was left behind. So we see a perfect picture. And so finally, Ezekiel 39 tells us this, verse 8. Behold, it is come and it is done, saith the Lord God. This is the day of whereof I have spoken. Okay, so God has singled out this day. <laughs> he singled out this day that he has spoken about. Okay, and so we've just gone over it in a little detail about this day. Okay, this is the day that he's spoken about. What day? The day of the Lord. The day when it all begins, beginning with the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church is what begins it. And so I forgot to go further on in 1 Kings chapter 19. But if we go further on in 1 Kings chapter 19, um, we see that Elisha is called. And then uh, uh, the king over Syria is called Hazael. And then Jehu is anointed to be king over Israel. So in types and shadows, just briefly, Hazael, king over Syria, that represents the Antichrist. Okay, the Assyrian who's going to come. And then Jehu, he represents all the destruction that's going to come on the cloudy and dark day as well. And then Elisha represents the two witnesses, okay, because he had a double anointing of the spirit of Elijah. And so the two witnesses appear, okay. And so we see a perfect picture. It goes a little bit deeper, but uh, you got the gist, okay. And so this chapter 19 of 1 Kings is a beautiful picture uh, of a shadow of what's going to happen on the day of the Lord. And I pray that it was edifying to you. Um, and I pray that God ministered to you because he wants us to understand these things. If there's anything that wasn't clear, please let me know in the comment section. I try through the power of the Holy Spirit to make things clear. And that's why these videos have to be so, you know, I don't think it's too long. But sometimes I get comments that it's too long. But hey, if you really want to understand these things, we, we have to go you know, we have to go in depth. You just can't do 10 minute videos, 15 minute videos in order to cover all this. OK, it's, it's a lot of information when you're pulling from all these different uh, things in the Bible, you know, to, in order to paint the picture. Because uh, even after doing an, an hour long video, there's still questions. And, you know, I'm, I'm open to answering these questions if they're sincere, uh, because I want us all to have a complete understanding because only God knows everything, and we're all working at this together. All of us have bits and pieces, like my sister Sherry Alexander said. We all have p pieces of the puzzle, and I thank God for the puzzle pieces that he's given me to share with the body of Christ. And so if you don't know him, I pray that you come to him by faith, admit that you're a sinner, 
confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you'll live forever. The choice is yours. The time is short and the king is coming. The only question is, are you ready? For surely he comes quickly. Maranatha. Amen.